An important quality to develop as you meditate is to learn how to reflect on yourself. You can be 100% sure that you're right about something. And if you don't reflect on yourself, you miss a lot of the things that you've put blinders on. Think about the Buddha going through all those austerities, taking it very seriously. And then finally realizing after six years it wasn't working. And didn't show any signs of working. If he pushed himself any further, he was going to die. So he reflected, this must be another way. This must be wrong. There's something I don't understand. Could there be another way? It was his ability to step back and consider that he'd been wrong. That's how he finally got it right. And so as we practice, we have to learn how to master the step of stepping back and looking at ourselves, and not believing everything the mind tells itself. And one good way of developing this quality is to learn how to have a sense of humor about yourself. They don't talk about humor much in the canon. In fact, I can't think of any places where they talk about it at all. But we're fortunate that we have the suttas. We can see the Buddha in action. We can see his sense of humor. When they recorded the Buddha's teachings, they recorded them in lots of different formats. Some people memorized his poems, some people memorized his dialogues, some people memorized his explanations of things. It's the one who memorized his dialogues and showed us how we interacted with other people. So we get a sense of his sense of humor. The Johns have a sense of humor as well. That was one of the things that first attracted me to John Fuan. And even the, the Johns had a reputation for being really strict and harsh. Had their sense of humor as well. And John Fuan tells a story about a John Mun. When a John Fuan first went to stay with him, he was still young. And there was a community of nuns that lived down the road. The monks would go past their community and on their way for alms. And there was one nun who took a liking to John Fuan, and she started knitting little things for him, making special Central Thai food for him. And as John was watching this, he noticed that John Fuan was not interested. So he decided to help the young nun. There was one time when the nuns came for instructions. And asked them if they were observing the eight precepts, and they said yes, they were. And then he talked to, about Lady Wisaka, seeing groups of people observing the eight precepts and going from group to group and asking them why they observed the eight precepts. She talked to some old people, and they said, "Well, we want to go to heaven." And she talked to the other groups, and finally came to a group of young women, asked them why they're observing the eight precepts. They say. They said, we want something better than heaven. We want a husband. That was the end of the knitted things and the special central Thai food. They even tell the story about Ajahn Mahabur, giving a Dharma talk one time about how people are obsessed with the lottery numbers in Thailand. There was an elderly monk who was there, and the elderly monk was in tears, laughing so hard. And the type of humor that's useful that the Johns had that I really appreciated was good-natured humor. And they had learned it by learning how to laugh at themselves. Seeing how they'd gotten into a rut or a straight arrow about something, absolutely convinced that where they were was going to have to be the way they were, things were going to be, that they were right on target, right on track. In the case of the monks who lived with John Mun, he would make a little comment to knock them off course a little bit, to make them stop and look back at themselves. 
and see where they were blind to certain defilements in their own minds. So it's a good habit to develop, learning how to laugh at your own foibles. I mean, we are serious about the practice. We are dealing with serious issues, aging, illness, and death. But we don't have to be grim about them. And we have to remember this is a middle way. If it were a way of extremes, it would be very easy to just push, push, push to the extreme and break through. But to find the point of just right requires that you act and then you reflect on your actions. Step back a bit. And that's what humor is all about, stepping back. The Greeks have a saying, the gods laugh, human beings cry. It's because the gods are removed. They see things happening in the human race at once remove. And they can see the irony, and they can see the incongruity of a lot of people's actions. And they're not threatened by them. That's the important thing. This is why a sense of humor goes with a sense of patience and endurance. On the one hand, humor teaches you to have some more patience and endurance. And patience and endurance makes it a lot easier for, to develop a sense of humor. So think of the two qualities going together. If you feel threatened by other people's misbehavior, it's hard to have any healthy goodwill for them or healthy compassion. It's hard to be good-natured about your goodwill and good-natured about your compassion. So you have to ask yourself, why am I feeling threatened? And it's because you don't have enough resources inside. So you learn how to develop those inner resources. Develop a sense of how you can feel at ease with yourself by the way you breathe, by the way you focus in the body. by the way you think about your meditation topics. And notice what you can do without in your surroundings. When you realize there's a lot you can do without, you can live simply. You don't need a lot in terms of entertainment or pleasures, because you've got a sense of well-being inside. Then you don't feel threatened. When you don't feel threatened, then this quality of being good-natured doesn't have to be just good-natured humor, but good-natured goodwill, good-natured compassion, good-natured discernment comes a lot more easily. So work on developing your inner resources. And learn how not to be threatened by the fact that you can laugh at yourself, because this is a, has a lot to do with being good-natured and your humor about other people. If your humor is aimed solely at making fun of them, then the quality of being good-natured gets spoiled. But if you turn around and look at yourself and say, oh yeah, I've got those qualities too. I've got those weaknesses too. Here I am railing against other people, and yet I've got those problems as well. And learn to laugh about that. Then you can do something about it, because it takes a lot of the power away from your defilements. If you treat them in a grim way, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. You're serious about them, but at the same time, you have a sense of proportion. And if you can laugh at them, you can cut them down to size. They're a lot more manageable. So look for the humor in your own foibles, and learn how not to be threatened by the foibles of other people. as you develop these two qualities of patience and humor together. As I said, they become good-natured, 
And then in all your dealings with other people in terms of your equanimity, is good-natured equanimity. And John Fuhr made the distinction between what he called large equanimity and small equanimity. You might call that large-hearted and small-hearted. Small-hearted is when you say, nothing's any good anywhere, but I'm just going to learn how to tough it out. Large-hearted is when you have a sense of well-being inside. And that sense of well-being is not threatened by anything outside. Small-hearted equanimity doesn't last long. Large-hearted has staying power. And that's what you want to develop as you practice, staying power. And when you develop with a sense of humor together, then you can stick it out all the way. And it's not just sticking out, it's not just enduring. There's a sense of lightness that goes with that. And when you can create a sense of lightness, both inside and out, then the things that are hard to bear become easy to bear. And the practice becomes something you can see all the way through.